Well, this morning we are taking a, a, a break from our study in the book of Jonah. And I, I had talked back in the summertime when we went through the, the arts of spiritual conversation. I said, that can never go away from this church. That understanding that God has called us to step out and um, to be part of his plan of reaching the world. And uh, this morning, we have the privilege of hearing uh, uh, from a dear brother, uh, Jeff Klein. Jeff um, is the one that helped put that Arts of Spiritual Conversation uh, package together. And uh, he has been a pastor, a church planner. He is uh, married, has what, four kids? And uh, I have asked him to come, and, and we're going to talk about what happens afterwards because there is a, a seminar following. But let's give a, a, a warm cross point welcome for Jeff Klein. Thanks, Matt. All right, brother. Amen. Get to him again. Well, it's great to be back here in, in uh, Gross Point. My, my uncle and aunt have lived here for years. My uncle is Jim is an eye doctor in the area. Um, Jim Klein, maybe some of you go to his practice, but they're out of town this week, so uh, this weekend at least I, I, I couldn't stay with them last night. Plus, I was also at home uh, late in the evening um, shaking m the hands of the dates of my daughters for homecoming. Uh, I had to shake those very firmly before I came to make sure they understood that I had a shotgun in the back room in case something went wrong, right? So, so it's good to be here with you in Gross Point this morning, and I love your pastors. They're, they're men after my own heart, you know. I think Matt and I could go out and play a football game together, just, you know, whack each other around a little bit. It'd be great. I'm an old hockey player, so it's great to be here with you. We're going to dig into Mark chapter 3 this morning. So if you have a Bible and you want to follow along, I would encourage you to open it, Mark 3. Verses 13 through 19, we're going to read those together, and then we'll pray and dig into this uh, together this morning. So Mark 3, 13 through 19, I'll start reading in verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach, and have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed, Simon to whom he gave the name Peter, James son of Zebedee and his brother John, to them he gave the name Boenerges, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Let's pray together. Lord God, my prayer this morning is that your Holy Spirit's voice would be the loudest voice in the room as we look into this passage together. That, Lord, we would leave here knowing that we have heard from you. In your mighty name, Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Now, at my house, I experience a phenomena every night of the week at dinner time. Years ago, I've been married for 28 years. Years ago, I realized that I'm a terrible cook. My wife is a great cook. So if she would cook the meals, I offered to clean the dishes up. Pretty good deal for me, pretty good deal for her. So we had that deal going for years. But, of course, now we have the new equation, which is four teenage children at the table with us, right? So my wife gets up from the dinner table, and she stands up and says, Okay, guys. Your dad's going to clean the dishes up. It'd be nice if somebody helped him do it. And then she leaves. You know what happens next, right? One kid gets up and says, well, uh, dad, I got a lot of homework tonight. I got to really get going. And another kid, I got soccer practice, dad, in a little while. I'm getting picked up shortly. And somebody else, I got I got uh, 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 pretty soon I'm standing by the dishes by myself. Nobody's around. They've all left. I didn't realize I was actually experiencing a psychological phenomenon that's been studied by psychologists. It's called the bystander effect. The larger the crowd of people in the room, the less likely someone is to take responsibility for what needs to get done. I didn't know that at all. In fact, my friend, when I talked to him about it, he said, yeah, this is something as a ski patrol instructor we were trained to combat. The bystander effect is if we came on an accident scene on the hill of a ski hill, there'd be a crowd of people gathered around. And if I would just yell out, somebody call an ambulance, everybody would assume somebody else would call the ambulance. And if, unless I pointed at somebody and said, you, 
get your cell phone out and call an ambulance. They, they wouldn't call an ambulance, and we would just never get help for the first time on the hill. Now, I think the American church is experiencing the bystander effect every week. We have crowds of people that gather in churches, and we listen to some preacher, this morning happens to be me, who gives us the word of God and kind of unpacks it for us and helps us understand it and helps us get it. And my sense is that most people sit out there thinking, this is awesome, it's a great sermon, somebody here will do it. And everyone gets up, and they go home. And, you know, everyone figures that as long as somebody in the church is doing it, maybe Pastor Jason or Pastor Matt or some other gifted individual is doing it, I'm off the hook. I don't have to really do it. My, my question this morning is, you know, when you look at verse uh, 13, it says, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. How many of you sitting here this morning have felt or heard Jesus called to you personally that he wants you and he's calling out to you to follow him. Yeah. Some of you have heard that call. Maybe some of you are still sitting here thinking, well, I mean, our church is following Jesus, right? So that's good enough. No, it needs to be discipleship is all about you hearing Jesus talk to you and saying, I want you to follow me. And you hear this call and you say, I'm going to take responsibility to follow Jesus myself because he's talking to me. Not just talking to a bunch of other people out there. He's talking to me. So my hope is that when you leave here this morning, you won't just think, well, I hope somebody in our church gets this. I hope you'll leave here this morning hearing Jesus say to you, in a whole new way, follow me. Now, now part of the problem might be that when we say, be a disciple, follow Jesus, I don't know if everyone un understands what that looks like. Part of our problem in following Jesus might just be that we don't really get how to do that. So this morning, I chose this passage because I think it's kind of like Jesus picks these guys and then he kind of tells them what they're going to be up to. So in verse 14, it says this, He appointed twelve, designating them to be apostles. And then he starts like this, that they might be with him. So the first thing about being a disciple of Jesus, the first thing you need to get when he calls your name is that you need to be with him. Christianity, if it's about anything, is about being with a person, Jesus. Now, this was built into the fabric of the culture back in this day. Uh, the, these kids, when they grew up, they started school at five years old. It was called the Bet Sefer School. In Bet Sefer School, you would study science, math, history, and the Torah. Torah being the first five books of the Old Testament. Do you know that th those kids in that school, from five years old to 12 years old, memorized the first five books of the Old Testament? At 12 years old, the boys would go home to learn the family trade. If your dad was a stonecutter, you were a stonecutter. If your dad was a fisherman, you were a fisherman. If your dad was a tanner, you were a tanner. The girls would go home to get married and begin having babies. At 15 years old, after working on the family trade for a few years, you would go back, if you were a boy, to Bet Midrash. Bet Midrash was a more advanced school, and in that school you'd continue your studies, and you especially would learn how to unpack what you have memorized, how to learn to interpret it and apply it to your life and dig into it deeper. So for the next several years, you would dig into it deeper, and you'd unpack it, and you'd learn it. And of course, in these schools, what would happen is, some students would become the best and the brightest at this. You know, that people would notice, wow, that guy is amazing at unpacking the scripture. He seems to have a gift that goes beyond the other students. And they, these kids would start to rise. So they were like the AP Torah kids. Okay? If you would, right? Those kids uh, often were, you know, they stood out. And what would happen in this culture is the rabbis would come through the towns where these schools were because they were looking for followers. And they were looking for the best and the brightest, the super students in the Torah, to follow them. So these rabbis would come to the school, and they would say, hey, you, buddy, I want you. I've heard about your reputation. Please come follow me. And what that meant was that you were going to be in this intense relationship with this rabbi. You would follow him around, and you would try to become like him, literally like him. This intense relationship would go on for years, and whatever the rabbi did, 
You did. The rabbi picked up a stone, you picked up a stone. I, I learned this all in Israel a, a few years ago. I went with Ray Vanderlaan, who's uh, from Grand Rapids, Michigan, Highland Mission area, and he, he has a website called Follow the Rabbi, but he took us to Israel, and he became our rabbi for the two weeks that we were there. Whatever Ray Vanderlaan did, we had to do. So he picked up a black rock, I picked up a black rock. He jumped in a pool, I jumped in the pool. He hiked through the desert, I hiked behind him through the desert. I remember one day, we were hiking through this wadi in the desert, 120 degree heat. We came to a Y in the road, and a few of the students decided to go left. He just let them go left. About a quarter mile down this wadi, somebody said, hey, Ray, are we going the right way? He said, I don't know. Ask these guys. They, be they decided to become the rabbi, so we're following them now. We had to hike back to the Y and go the other way because we stopped following the rabbi. That's, that's the kind of relationship we're talking about here. Now, the kids who didn't make the cut... The best and brightest kids got picked by the rabbis. The kids who didn't make the cut, you know what they did? They went back to their family trade. Fishing, tanning, carpentry. So I, so I have a question for you. When Jesus came along as this amazing rabbi and called his disciples, what were they doing? Back in their family business. Which means that they were not the best and the brightest. They were not the super students. They were just ordinary, regular kids who were just trying to do their best to live their life. And along comes this amazing rabbi and says, Hey, you, follow me. Now, I love this because I love that Jesus didn't choose the super students. He chose the regular people like us. It means that when Jesus calls you to follow him, he's calling you to be with him. And anybody can do it because these guys that he picked, they were nothing special. They were just regular guys. And what he's inviting you into is this, this amazing, intense relationship with him where you are deeply connected to him and where you learn to do what he did. You know, it says in Luke 640 that when you're fully trained as a student, you'll be like your teacher. Jesus' invitation to be a disciple is to be with Jesus, learning to be like him and learning to soak in everything he wants to give you in that relationship. Yeah, I love how John says it in 1 John 1.1. He says this, That which our eyes have seen and our ears have heard and our hands have touched and our minds have looked into, this we proclaim to you. See, John was a disciple. He saw Jesus, he heard Jesus, he touched Jesus, he thought about Jesus. That's the kind of relationship we're talking about. This is where discipleship begins. Becoming a person who is with Jesus. Now, the Jewish people were amazing because they realized most people couldn't do this stuff without reminders. So in the book of Numbers, Moses describes a shawl like this that they all made and wore. Jesus wore one of these, I think. I think his disciples wore these. I think these boys in the schools wore these. The, the amazing symbolism of this shawl is that it's made out of 613 kinds of thread representing the 613 laws of the Torah. And then these tassels are very symbolic. There's five knots, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And there's four spaces, Y-H-W-H. So they wore these to remind them of this intense relationship they were to have with their God. Now, we're probably not going to wear these around anytime soon, but the reality is, what is it that reminds you throughout the week to be with Jesus? Because that's where it all begins. To follow that person of Jesus Christ, to connect with him deeply, intimately, so that you can become like him and do the things that he did. That's what a disciple is. So that's where it begins. Now, Jesus goes on. He, he adds to this. Look at verse 14 again. So he says, He appointed them 12, designated them apostles, that they might be with him, and then he might send them out to preach. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Jesus came because God is on a mission. God was not surprised when the creation went south in Genesis 3. This was not surprising to God. He's all-knowing. He knew it was going to go south when he made the place. So he already had a plan in place before he created 
to sum it all up in Jesus Christ. He had already tapped his son in the deepest part of heaven to deal with the problem that was coming. He planned for it. He knew that it would be a greater good through Jesus that could ever result in just creation. So when Jesus comes to earth, he comes on God's mission. And when he invites people to follow him, it's not just to be in a holy huddle and hang out together as a bunch of, you know, followers of Jesus. He invites people to join him in what he's doing, to be on this mission. It's awesome. So when you follow Jesus, you get to, get, you get to become part of what he's doing on the earth. You get to become part of the mission of God and the earth. Now, you know, I know it says here, send them out to preach. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, you should go out and preach. I'm not saying you should start preaching on the street corners of Gross Point. You know, all of a sudden we got a bunch of cross point people out there with their soap boxes. You know, no, I mean, this is getting involved in the mission in a way that fits who you are, the way that God's gifted you. I, I love Mark 1, 16 and 17. Jesus comes along the sea, says to these guys, come, follow me. And how does he finish the sentence? And I will make you fishers and men. So when he asks them to follow him, he's not just saying, hey, just come hang out with me. We'll just become good people together. And then we'll just celebrate how good we are, how cool we are, how we're just in this Jesus thing. He goes, no, come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. You get to join me in this amazing mission that God sent me on. Now God appoints and raises up all kinds of people for this mission. And he gives many of them different roles that kind of fit their personality, their passions, their abilities, their gifts, where they live, where they work. And this is great that the church of Jesus leaves this building and goes and infiltrates the world. And wherever you go, the church is. Wherever you go as a disciple of Jesus, you're with him. He's with you. You're on his mission. This is awesome. Now, so many of the stories that we tell um, from the front of church, and in fact, I just did this last service. It hit me between services, so I'm going to tell a different story. We often tell stories about the professional Christians, like, you know, Matt and I, Jason. You know, we, we're the professional Christians. So, so we always kind of hold up these examples of people that are doing this professional stuff. Can you be a disciple of Jesus and have a regular job? My favorite speaker at the Willow Creek Leadership Summit just about a month and a half ago was Alan Katerine Kajina. She is the head of the Ugandan Revenue Service, the IRS of Uganda. She said that before she became the head, she worked in the Revenue Service for years as a Christian, and she said it was the second most corrupt government agency in all of Uganda, second only to the police. So at some point during her time there, they recognized her amazing work uh, efforts, her amazing work ethic, the way she related to people around her. And they said, you know, we think you should run this place. And she was like, who am I to run this place? Are you kidding me? But she said yes because she felt like Jesus was telling her, I'm sending you. Go do this. So she took over the Uganda Revenue Service, the second most corrupt government agency in the whole country, and she immediately fired all 300 employees. And then she started a rehiring process where she wrote a whole new description of who was going to work with the IRS of Uganda. And she hired back the people with character and with concern who were good people. Do you know what happened? One year into her term, the Uganda Revenue Service had taken in 300% more money than they had any other time in its history. Now people from the other part of the government are taking people from her uh, area and hiring them because they're so amazing. This is just a woman who is a follower of Jesus who said yes to his call and started to run the Uganda Revenue Services, cleaned it up. This is what we get to do. We get to join Jesus in what he's doing there in the world. We get to, to jump in and become part of his mission on planet Earth. It can, it can happen all different ways. Uh, there's a guy who comes to my church in Wheaton. His name is John Vierre Habimana. He came from the Congo. He lived for 10 years in a refugee camp there. Um, he's the most amazing guy. He has no schooling like me. He has no MDiv like me. He doesn't, you know, like, I mean, us MDiv guys, we can kind of walk on water. You know how that works, right? This guy's just a regular dude. But you know what he is? He's a follower of Jesus. And he spends his time with Jesus. And the guy's amazing. In fact, I think he knows things about Jesus that I don't know because of the way he follows him and because of what, he, what he's been through. We were, we, were, uh, we were raking leaves in my yard 
we were pulling the blue tarp with the leaves. He stopped me and said, hey, this is the roof of my, uh, my house in, in uh, the refugee camp. That's where he had his kids. Now he's come to America, and instead of just coming to America and taking for himself, he considers it his mission from Jesus to help other refugees settle in America. This guy has virtually no money, can hardly speak English, virtually no education, but because Jesus has called him, he tells me all the time, Daddy, he calls me Daddy, God is good, and I'm going to help people. Because this is what God and Jesus has done for me. Wow! It doesn't take a rocket scientist. Now, some of you will tell me, well, I'm just not ready for this. You know, I need more training. I need more. I, 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 get, I get what you're saying. But let's just think about this for a second. Because in Mark, Mark chapter 5, there's this garrison demoniac, right? Jesus takes his disciples to this area in Israel, which is the worst of the worst. It's the most pagan area. There's 10 cities there of Alexander the Great. The ruins are still there. And he probably was thinking of that area when he told the prodigal son story, where the, where the place where the prodigal son ran off to do all of his crazy stuff. And remember, there's a hill full of pigs there. And this guy is living in the tombs, chained there because he's full of demons. And Jesus comes along, he casts out the demons, puts them in the pigs. The pigs run into the water, they drown. And this guy is sitting there dressed in his right mind. And he... You know, the, the people of the town, they go, hey, Jesus, get out of here. Get out of here. You're messing up our whole thing here. you got to get out of here. So he gets back in the boat with his disciples, and this guy runs down. Hey, Jesus, let me come. I want to come with you. And Jesus says, no, no, you can't come with me. I want you to go back to your family and your friends in the town where you live and tell them what the Lord has done for you. This guy's never been to church, as far as I can tell. Never heard a Bible study. Never been in a Bible study, never read the Bible, never been in an evangelism training seminar. And Jesus is sending him immediately to tell the world what the Lord has done for him. Are you really not ready? I mean, how many sermons have you heard, folks? How many seminars? How many Bible studies? We're more than ready. We just have to be willing to follow Jesus and get involved in his mission. And that's what the, really, the arts of spiritual conversation is all about this. It's about giving you some really basic ways that you can enter the mission of God. Can you notice people? Pay attention to them. Begin to feel the compassion of Christ for them in your community. Can you pray for them behind their backs? Yeah, you could. Anybody can do that. Even the introverts can do it. You don't have to say a word. <laughs> And you can get on the mission of Jesus. Okay? So that's the two things. First, it's being a disciple is being with Jesus in this intense relationship. Secondly, it's getting involved in the mission that he came to do. But there's a third element that he says in this verse 14. He says this. He appointed 12. Does the name of apostles they might be with him. That he might send them out to preach. And then verse 15 says, And have authority to drive out demons. Whoa. Are we supposed to drive out demons? I mean, we, you know, we don't even know if we believe in demons, half of us. We're not even sure if we see demons. Well, clearly we see the effects of demons in our world. Uh, but am I going to tell you this morning, you've got to all learn how to drive out demons? Uh, probably not. But notice that word authority. These guys were told to walk with spiritual authority. It seems to me that so many people in the church, when they come to follow Jesus, they don't really have much spiritual authority. Seems to me I don't have often a lot of spiritual authority. It's like I'm giving the world what other things can give the world. You know, the VFW and the, the local food pantry. The, the church of Jesus should be able to give the world something that no one else in the world can duplicate. Because we, according to Ephesians 1, have the same power in us that raised Jesus from the dead. So we should be able to do things in the world that no one else can do because we have the power of the resurrected Jesus living in us and among us. But so often now, it seems like the church just does all the things everybody else does. No wonder when no one's paying attention. So we need to start to learn to walk in spiritual authority. You know, these apostles, these guys who were appointed, they were just ordinary guys. They didn't have a clue when they first got called. If you follow their story, they're mostly clueless. But by Acts chapter 3, when they walk in the temple and there's a, a blind beggar, there's a, not a blind, he's just a lame guy. 
He's there by the temple gate. He's probably been there for years. In fact, Jesus probably passed him several times and didn't heal him. He left him for Peter and John. And the guy says, hey, I need some money. I need some money. I need some money. And they say, hey, we don't have any money. But what we have, we give to you. And they took him by the hand. Stand up and walk. And two minutes later, he's in the temple courts dancing and praising and worshiping his God. Now that gets people's attention. You know, I was going to uh, Wrigley Field a few years ago. I know I'm a Cubs fan. 54 years of suffering with the Cubs. Um, it's like, you know, it's like following, a, you know, you're not sure they minor league baseball, major league. We're not sure what they are, but, you know, it's a nice place to go to the game. So, so I'm taking my whole family to the Cubs game. It's going to cost me like 300 bucks to do this, to pay for a bunch of guys' salaries that can't really play baseball. Um, Man, I just wish I would have stayed with my baseball thing, you know what I'm saying? Like, I could have made like a million dollars just sitting on a bench, you know, hitting every so often. So anyway, that's another whole thing. So um, so we're going to the Cubs game. You know, the bars are hopping. The people are jumping. The, the place is, is going, you know, doing its thing. Uh, and everyone's going along. We're walking along to get to their gate where our tickets go. And my wife says to me, in the middle of all this noise, she says, shouldn't we stop? I say, honey, what are you talking about? And she points to the wall. Against the wall, Wrigley Field, there was a man in a wheelchair, no legs, with a sign asking for help. I said, I guess we probably should stop. And I went over and talked to him. And I was thinking, okay, how can I help this guy? He wants money. Uh, I said, you know, normally I give him a couple bucks, but I guess we're about to spend $300 on a Cubs game. Probably should be a little more generous. So I think I put $10 in his cup. Whoa. Huh? Are you impressed? Yeah, and then I didn't think about him again. Went home. The next morning, a couple days later, I was reading through the book of Acts. I read Acts chapter 3. And you know what my thought was? That's all I got, 10 bucks. For a guy who needs a whole lot more. I am a follower of Jesus, the Jesus who rose from the dead. And all I got for this guy is 10 bucks in his cup. We've got to have more for the world than that. You know, I, I love the scene in uh, uh, Lord of the Rings when Gandalf is in that, they're inside that cave and that giant dragon Balrog is coming out and his friends are running and they're running from this thing. It's breathing fire. It's obviously demonic. And he stands on that narrow bridge and he says with his staff, he goes, you will not pass here. You will not pass. You know, I, I can't do it like him, but it's, it's good. Right? You will not pass. He, he bangs the thing, and then eventually he gets sucked down in the, the depths of hell with this thing, right? We need some people from the church of Jesus, followers of Jesus, to stand in the world and say, you will not pass here to the demons that are trashing this place. And we're sitting around sometimes bemoaning the, the condition of the world. Guess what? You were called to stand in the gap and say, you will not pass here. Yeah, you, the ordinary followers of Jesus, you can do this. You can do this. Now, I heard a guy speak not too long ago, and what he said has stuck with me, and I can't get it out of my head. As a longtime pastor and person who works with a lot of churches, I just can't get this out of my head. He's, he's, his name is Steve Moore from Missio Nexus. He travels mostly to Africa and Asia to do his work. And this particular thing, he said this. He said, when the gap between... What we know and our obedience and what we do gets wider. Spiritual power in the church decreases. He said in American church, that gap is huge. Then he said, in disciple-making movements around the world where, people, where disciples of Jesus are having a major impact, they know a little and they do a lot. In America, we know a lot and we do a little. He said, we've actually developed a whole definition of discipleship, of spiritual maturity, that's a knowledge-based definition. When the scriptures and everyone else in the world has an action-based definition. My sense is these disciples, they knew a little. But at the time the story is over, they had done a lot. I hope this morning you won't leave here and continue to be a bystander. 
just one of the crowd hanging out, doing church. I hope you'll leave here this morning and you'll hear Jesus calling to you about your part in following him. All right, I'm going to invite Pastor Matt to come back up. So you might be asking the question, amen. Amen. You might be asking the question, so now what? You know, again, you've got knowledge. And here's what I understand about us as a body. We do have a lot of good Bible studies. We have good Bible teachers here. But we have to take what we know and we have to, we have to wring it out. Um, things we've been talking about, after the service, we're going to have a seminar. And, and uh, some of you have signed up for it and some of you haven't. Here's, here's what I want to propose. Uh, for those of you that signed up, we have food for you. Um, you're going to go downstairs. We're going to eat down there very quickly, and then we're going to come back up here. Probably around 12.45, we will get started back here. For those of you that didn't sign up, run out, get something to eat, come back, because here's, here's what we want to do with this. You can have all the Bible knowledge in the world, and many of you have that, but you're not impacting anyone. The things you've heard in the presence of many witnesses commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. We want you to be part of a group of three or four people, men with men, women with women, and the goal of that is not only to help each other grow, not only to help each other hold each other accountable, but also to work out these arts of spiritual conversation to where we say, you know, okay, brother, you know, you say you love Jesus. Who are you praying for? Who are you noticing? Who are you reaching out to? Because if we don't do that, it's just going to be another series and nothing's going to happen. So we do want to take this and we want to ring it out. In this church, we got a lot of decent things going on. We're not perfect by no stretch of the imagination. But we got a lot of things going on. We have a lot of ministries. We got a mops. We got to celebrate recovery. We got a lot of good things that are going on. We have Bible studies. We had great kids programs. But where we lack is life on life discipleship, where we where we live it out and we encourage each other to go the next er, the next step and live this out. Many of you for years come in, you leave. And and what we need to be able to do is have Jeff say to me. So who are you reaching out? Who are you praying for? And being the body to, the, to this lost and dying world. I hear people bemoan what is going on in America. Did you hear this is happening? Did you hear that's happening? Yeah, there's a lot of bad things that are happening. But you know what's going to change it? Believers being light in a dark world. That's the issue. I, I, no offense. I don't want to hear any more complaining about America. Let, let us be what God wants us to be, and he will use us. So I want to invite you out to this. I, I do want us to, you know, and some of you, man, some of you, I, I want to take some of you that you know so much, and I want to put you, we have people here that are brand new believers. I want to plug you in with them. And people that are, that are new, I want, I want you to walk with them. I want you to encourage them. I want you to be that example to them. And so that's what we're, we're going to try to do. I don't know what God's going to do, but I do know this. He's going to do something in this body where he uses you. Some of you have been on the sidelines for a few years. It's time for you, ladies with ladies, men with men, get back in the game, get back into pouring your life into someone, get back into making a difference, get back into praying about how can we reach this world that doesn't know Jesus. And, and he will, he'll use us. Let's stand and I want to dismiss this in a word of prayer. And again, um, if you didn't sign up for it, come back. We can make extra copies of the stuff we're going to do. We'll be back by uh, 1245. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for Jeff and and really, your calling in his life uh, to make a difference and to challenge churches to um, get outside our comfort zone and really be what the Bible calls us to be. Lord, there is a gap, and there's a, even a gap in this church of what we know and what we do. So help us to bridge that gap. Help us to be what you want us to be. Help us to live it out, not for the praise of men, but for the glory of God, that there would be people who do not know you that will one day be in heaven because we have been your instruments, we have been your missionaries, your disciples to proclaim the good news of Jesus. 
So Lord, do your work in our lives. If, if there is a stubbornness in us where we just want to leave here and go back to the same old, lame, do-nothing lifestyle, if that is where our heart is, Lord, I pray that you would break us, that you would change us for your glory. Thank you for what you're going to do. We give you the praise in Jesus' name.